Right, here we are. It's a Monday afternoon. I'm talking to David Mukhashwa, the chairman of Moraka Swallows Group, chairman of Mahuti Group. This is a man who is very, very engaged on social media. Everybody talks to him. He talks to other people. He has memes. Um, but this is a businessman at the end of the day. Welcome, Chairman, to the Cash and Sport. First, this is the first ever podcast, actually, or first ever conversation that I've had with someone. So you are the first person that I've had a discussion with to talk to you <laughs> about the behind the scenes stuff, yeah. the money stuff that goes into your daily life and how you make decisions or how you even got here. But Chairman, welcome to the Cash and Sport podcast. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for availing yourself. No, thank you very much for inviting me and I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> I'm sure you won't. I'm yeah. sure you won't. But anyway, Chairman, let's let's get right into it. Um, you're David Mukhashwa, you, you run a, a successful business now, but you didn't start there. How did you become who you are now? Tell us about your journey in business. How, when did you even start your first business? Because I know the things that are in the CIPC, those are not an indication of when people started their businesses. Most would have started a backroom business or whatever, whatever. How did you get into business? And tell us a little bit about yourself from then to now. Look, um, as you said, I'm David Morash. I was actually born in KZN and my father passed away when I was five. Um, originating from Limpopo, then my mother thought it was best that we move back to Limpopo. You know, Limpopo is known for, for fruits and stuff but uh, behind that there's also poverty the big poverty you know that's why when uh, people talk to me with this mix it or broken english or i get upset because my mother didn't have money to take me to school you know she did hard labor you know when uh, they were building yeah. classrooms the government didn't provide classrooms you know um, the parents had to go and build those cl uh, classrooms others had to donate money but my mother didn't have uh, money to donate or to pay for for my school fees so she did hard labor to for me to do the schooling so um, i did my schooling there in limpopo and then i came to joe back in 1995 okay by then, she was a domestic worker here in Johannesburg. Uh, she worked in Bedford View and I arrived at her place. She had a small place there. She had a one bedroom, a kitchen and a bathroom. And I stayed with her for about two months. And then I started looking around because I wanted to have my own place so, so that I can do my own things because I had my own dreams as well. So yeah, I started there and um, it wasn't easy um, because I had to find a job. I couldn't just come here and become my mother's problem. And you know, you don't arrive in Joburg and walk into a job. You know, the first job that I did was actually um, a gardener, you know. Um, as I was looking for a job, I uh, came across a guy and he said to me, um, I don't have money to pay you, but you can do my garden three times a week. I'll give you accommodation. I said, okay, that's fine. And I took it. Um, so I did his garden for three days. I got accommodation, but then I realized that I need to eat, so to eat to get money. So I looked for casual jobs that I could do in between the days that um, I was not doing his garden for accommodation. And that landed up uh, at a bushery in Jamiston where I was a meat packer. I started there as a meat packer and then I worked yeah. there for, yeah, I worked there for, I think it was about uh, three months. And then they moved me to the back to go carry meat, you know, carrying a, a half yes, cat. You know how heavy they you know, yeah, yes, you know how yeah. heavy that thing is. <laughs> yeah, then I moved there. I moved there, but uh, you know, the man was not enough because I was earning 75 rands a week. And uh, 75 rands can't do much, 75 rands. Then I said, okay, best is I need to go look for work. To top up my 75 rands because at the bush I only worked until one on a Saturday afternoon. So I looked for a job where I can work from one o'clock up to Sunday. I walked to Eastgate because um, it was about 40 minutes walk from where my mother stayed. So I walked there and um, looked for a job. I went to Edgar's, I went to Fushini's because you know Eastgate was just full of uh, retailers, uh, clothing retailers. Um, you know, just being so fresh from Limpopo, you know. It, Limpopo's English is like, well, therefore, you know, it's like, you know, it's not so proper. So those guys at Edgar's looked at me and said, ah, this one's going to speak to our customers, Gaspady. So, hey, no, I'm yeah. going anyway. So and then yeah. I walked to Fashini's and uh, they asked me for my CV. My CV was just a scribble. I mean, it was a half page. So I gave them my yeah. CV. And to my surprise, on a Tuesday, I was called in. You know why I was called in? Someone called in sick and then they yeah. were short-staffed. 
<laughs> they were short staff, so they needed someone to fill in. So they remembered, no, I mean, there's this guy that came here looking for a job. Let's call him. Mm. They called me in and I didn't disappoint. You know, they actually now offered me a full-time job. So okay. I quit. I quit the, the butchery. I told the guy where I was working for accommodation, I said, yeah, chief, now I found a job. I'm going to find myself accommodation, but please let me stay at your place for about three months. I'll wake up in the morning. I'll do your garden before I go to work because I started at eight. So I had to wake up at four, get ready, do his garden quickly so that by seven o'clock, I get into a taxi, I'll go to a job. So I started yeah. my job and he agreed. So I started my, my job at Fushini's. My salary there was 1,610 rands. I don't forget the 10 rands because it never made sense to me. So I worked there. <laughs> <laughs> I worked there. That was, uh, okay. that was now 1996. So I worked there for yeah. about three years. Yeah. And then uh, I left. I went to um, Neshua, the copier company. Yes, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, I went to Neshwa. I worked there from uh, 99 up to 2003. Yeah. 2003, yeah. So I was doing well there. I think my first trip overseas was paid for by Neshwa because I reached my targets. So What uh, were you doing at Neshwa? I was what in sales. We were selling photocopies. Oh, okay. Yeah, selling photocopies. You know how hard is it to sell photocopies? Like yeah. trying to sell an ice cream, ice cream you know? So... Mm. I did that until 2004 when I joined Imperial. So Imperial, I started off in sales as well. Um, within a year, I was promoted to sales manager within six months to dealer principal until 2009, when I felt that I've been repeating the same thing for over and over again. So I need uh, growth. So I started my business. Uh, it actually didn't go well. Um, started off, it promised, and then uh, 2009, it was promising, you know, just breaking even, not really making money. And uh, 2010, uh, it, there was a bit of improvement. 2011, things fell apart um, because it was quiet. I had one bad client that didn't pay. You know, those customers that want goods, but they don't pay. Um, yeah. Didn't pay and then uh, things went bad. It went terrible. Uh, where I almost lost my house. I gave away my cars because I could live without them. So not, not voluntarily. I mean, the bank came for them, you know? So <laughs> let's, go let's go back a little bit, Chairman. You, yeah. you started a business. What was the business doing? Look, the business was doing tires. But because I was from Imperial, um, mm. I knew more about motor uh, vehicles. I didn't want to go into photocopiers because I knew how rough that industry is. So I wanted yeah. to focus on mechanical of the vehicles. Um, yeah. You know, then I thought tires would be uh, easy because um, it's an everyday use. So your vehicle needs tires. You buy a new vehicle, we know that within a year or two, you're going to need tires. There's a used car market, you, you know, they need tires, you know. There's yeah. tracking, there's a lot of uh, things that need tires. But also there was a plan to expand into a full mechanical uh, uh, workshops. But I started with tires, but I didn't start with my own workshop. So what I did is I outsourced the business. I looked for the customers, but then outsourced yeah. throughout the country. Because, you know, even now I still don't believe in uh, uh, bricks and mortar. Yeah, that's why my business is based mostly, mostly on uh, mobile workshops. So yeah. 20... When was it? About uh, 2011. Yeah, things went bad and the banks came for their cars. Well, I didn't really care because I wanted to protect my house. So the house was yeah. protected, uh, went through a bit of a slump. Uh, 2012, 2013, I was now, you know, I started working again, but it was slow because, you know, when you've lost two of your cars, then the one was a bucky that I used to do some deliveries when I needed to do deliveries. And one was a private car that I could use to go visit my family or do whatever I wanted to do. Then mm -hmm. I lost the bucky, which was the main thing. And I lost the one that I was using uh, daily. So yeah. I decided, you know what, let me just get a cheap car that I can use. I bought myself a Ford Tracer, if you remember those uh, Ford yes, Tracer yeah, uh, Master yeah. Majors. Yeah, I used that just to move around and uh, things started picking up. But then what I did is I went back to the banks and said, guys, you took my cars. How much do I yeah. owe you? Can we get to some arrangement? Because I want to get back into to, to the credit life. Because if you don't, if you're not uh, credit worthy, then you can't uh, expand. So yeah. I negotiated for settlements because the things were picking up now. I negotiated settlement, but then it affected me because now you're taking money that's supposed to be growing your business to now settling debts. Yeah. So now that yeah. money is not revolving back into the business. So now you have to work twice as hard. So hard, I negotiated yeah. with the banks and then uh, 
fortunately, I mean, on a debt, I mean, I remember one when the ticket, my balance was 120,000. We actually settled on about 60,000 and the other one we settled on 58,000. So I settled them and then I had to wait for those uh, items to be cleared of the TransUnion and uh, other credit bureaus. And once they were yeah. cleared, then that's when I started working. I started uh, growing, you know. Wow. So then, so so you, man, you start off as a gardener. You you living, you're working for free, but also accommodation. And then you start yeah. carrying Gaga on your shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> And, and then and then you go into Nashua and then to eventually you start you start your own business. Yeah. But then now I saying that you didn't have a hard enough time growing your own business. Now you you are successful and now you want to throw your money away into a football team, in a money pit of a football team. Um, you know what what inspired you to get into football? Um, I know Panyaza says he he harassed you and harassed you and harassed you until you eventually got into it. <laughs> But how did you, what prompted the, the feeling to get into football? Were you always a football fan? What happened? I was always a football fan. And, uh, you know, my football uh, 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 thing, actually, it's, uh, it's complicated, you know. Um, yeah. I'm in entanglement yeah. with Kaiser Chiefs, you know, because there was a time, <laughs> there was a time where someone was disappointed and said, you know what, I'm moving to Chiefs. And yeah. I actually moved to Chiefs so about a year and so it's like, okay, then I'm moving back to Solos. So okay. I'm between Chiefs and Solos. But, yeah. you know, you're right. Business, uh, I mean, so, uh, business of football costs a lot of money and uh, it's yeah. money that you cannot get back. And I always think of my, my, you know, the people that work for my company because uh, yeah. when I started my company, I was alone. I was everything. I was actually the Jomos owner of the business. So yeah. it was just me. And today there are 84 people working for my for me. So I always have to think about those people and make sure that the decisions I take does not affect them negatively. Yeah. So yes, so Panyaza started harassing me uh, because uh, there was a time where he wanted to bring back solos through Free State Stars. I don't know if you remember yes. that. When yes, you I remember, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then he was talking about consortiums, this consortiums. I said, nah, you know what, my friend, when it comes to consortiums, I'm not there. Because the next thing, you want to hire Benny McCarthy, they say, no, bring Eric Tingler. Then you spent the whole day arguing about who should be coming and who should not be coming. So where yeah. there are consortiums, you won't find me. I need to be yeah. able to decide that this is the coach that's coming, we sign right now. So I don't need to be consulting yeah. with other people and stuff. And then it ended there. And then he yeah. came again, uh, um, just before last season started and said, uh, hey, my friend, remember that dream of bringing Solos to the... I said, I, I don't remember. I know because I'm there with the team because, you know, remember, Solos was in ABC Mutsepe. So when I was there with him all the time. I, was, I think I actually attended more games than him in the ABC Mutsepe, even though now he's attending more games in the PSL than me because I actually yeah. don't have the time to go to the stadiums. So, yeah. you know, the dream was there. Last season, we decided, okay, let's do this um let's bring the team in but the team will only be in uh, uh nfd for one season it was nfd then okay. because we didn't know that glad africa was going to come in i was like the team must only be there for one season because we can't keep pouring money in that division uh, while the plan is to go into the psl and we cannot start right. in the psl because it costs a lot of money to stay there so yeah. if you make mistakes there you won't be able to recover because you're spending a lot of money there. Then we decided yeah. to um, look for teams available at, at that time. It was uh, Bombella United. Um, yeah. it was, um, there was rumors that Stienberg was available, but that was through a third party. So we didn't really take that like uh, seriously. And yeah. then we negotiated with Bombella. But then yeah. things hit a snag because we we're running out of time. And the owners was like, so guys, if we can't wrap this up now, then let's can the sale. As we agreed yeah. to can the sale, Maccabi becomes available. Then yeah. we arrange a meeting with the Maccabi owners, uh, Alan, and uh, he agrees. We met him on a Sunday. And then Monday, yeah. the deal was done. So we just had to write to the yeah. PSL and make an announcement that uh, Maccabi sold to, to Solos. Then it's going to be known as Solos FC. And then we started okay. from there. We started the planning. They didn't go well because we started played five games with no signs of results. And then we had to part ways with the coach. We got in Truta, yeah. and then uh, we are in the PSL now. So um, it costs a lot of money to run a team because the same amount that you're spending in the PSL is the same amount that the, the, the Glad Africa Championship teams are spending. Because, for example, yeah. 
you go and play in Cape Town, the airlines are not going to say, because you are from Glad Africa Championship, we give you less uh, money. You must spend oh, yeah. less. No, you, you must pay the same money that the Chiefs is playing when they go to Cape Town. So it is very yeah. uh, frustrating because you yeah. end up in the, in the Glad Africa Championship, but spending the same money with the PSL that's getting 2 million and you're getting 500,000. Yeah. So, so that's so where the challenge is. So then on top of that, right, you are... Yeah. Swallows doesn't have a principal sponsor apart from Bahuiti. You guys are you 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 essentially sponsor the team, right? Yes. Uh, there's yes, no we don't have Abu Vodacom that sponsored Chiefs and Pirates and Point Millions no. and so on. So no. how is it fun? Do you think we're not, it's um, are you on the search for a, a headline sponsor? Um, do you think it's financially viable for you to continue? Um, what what's the plan in, in respect of that and uh, and a headline sponsor? I know you have other partners, but uh, a headline sponsor is needed. A headline sponsor is needed. We're actually in advanced talks now. We should be announced in about three weeks. So we've made yeah. uh, good success. So Solos is safe. So we had to keep putting money into the Solos brand because it's a big brand and the people wanted it back. So it has to yeah. come back. So, But uh, okay. we'll be making an announcement in about three weeks, yeah. Okay, that's 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 a good one. Uh, hopefully, this video will be out before then, so I can tell people to look forward to something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm no, joking. definitely. No, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but okay. No, all right. Um, I see now, we're chasing time. He's giving us countdown. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I I can see. Yeah, I can see. So in any yeah. case, let me t uh, tell me something about um, right. In in terms of you and and swallows, right? It's a big operation. You don't run it on your own. No. What does it take in terms of expertise in the background? Uh, you've got 84 people working for you at Bahuiti. What does the team look like at, at Swallows? Swallows are 64. So you've got 84 plus 64. And every day I'm treating and still looking after those people. So yeah. um, Swallows have got 19 people running the club. So that is okay. looking after the players and making sure the day-to-day -day, uh, running of the business goes well because we've got a right. CEO there, we've got his assistants and they've got their own assistants. Then you've got a right. team manager who's got his uh, own assistants and the kit managers. Then you've got the technical team, the head of supporters. Yeah. We've got yeah. all those people there making sure that the team runs well. So that's why wow. I've got so much time because there are people that are actually doing the work. I don't have right. to do the work myself. Oh, that's why people are saying you're the, you're the tweeting chairman. You've got time. Yeah. To... I'm, I'm... <laughs> Imagine now if I'm now going to be doing all these things, being the CEO yeah. of the club and all those. No, no, no. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now, now all of that work that you do at Swallows, it serves to, to put up a compelling brand for, for people to be attracted to. But yeah. how do we, as football in South Africa, I'm talking now not only Swallows because it's not a Swallows only issue. How do we make sure, Wuchi, these casual fans who see Swallows is now in the in the in the DSTV Premiership and so on and so on? How do we make sure, Wuchi, those guys after COVID are now coming into stadiums? How do we create a good value proposition for them to come into stadiums? Because by Kalangan, yes, security, but there's no security when they go to stadiums. But the yeah, entertainment, the, the amount of time it's going to take me two hours to get a stadium. How do we create a value proposition for them to get a stadium and, and support teams? You know, it needs to start on the field of play. The guys need to play entertaining football for people to be attracted to that kind of football. And then next, yeah. it needs to go to us, the administrators, to make sure that it is a smooth experience going to the stadium. People shouldn't be waiting two hours to get into a stadium. It, it should be very smooth. We should plan and make sure that there's enough entrances into the stadium and there's enough exits when they want to leave the stadium. And there has to be entertainment and we have to engage with those supporters. So we cannot be uh, far away and expect people just to come and sit on the stand, watch football for 90 minutes and go. There has to be entertainment yeah. as well. And we have to, while they're there, there has to be other programs that in informs them about the game and also informs them about safety around the stadium. We have to inf involve the, the police to make sure that there's enough visibility at the stadium. We can't have people fearing to go to the stadiums. It shouldn't be like that. No, I completely agree, Chairman. I think that's a that's a very good thing that you're saying. Um, and I think that um, that leads me on to my next question. Stadiums. Are there plans for, for Swallows to build a stadium? Or what are the pitfalls with you know behind that? Because I I believe that for for us to con to to provide that entertainment and for for fans to want to come to a place which they feel like home, it'll be best for a team to actually own the stadium so that they can build facilities. Me and you were talking prior to this about museums and so on and so on within a stadium so that you pr you provide entertainment but also a place where you can derive value out of it for the team to make money as well. 
It costs a lot of money to, to build a, a stadium. You'd need about 65 million rands to start, and that cost might balloon as we as we go along. The immediate plan for Solos is to make sure that we build a training facility, something more like your Naturena, where you can have your development and first team together at the same place. And at that venue, that's when you can have your museums and other uh, things that you can sell so that supporters know exactly where they're going because the development is core of the sport. So we need to make sure that we develop the young ones but then make sure you have the best facilities to attract those uh, the talent that you need to come to your facilities. And then stadium, we can always partner with municipalities and then make sure that we yeah. partner with the local municipalities. Then we have a set venue. Then we know that Solos only plays at Dobsonville if it's home because we know yeah. that our supporters are around that area. It's easier for them to walk to the stadium instead of having to yeah. catch a transport to go to Mbombela for a team that's based in Joburg. Okay. All right. That's fair enough. Um, it, it is a costly exercise and you wouldn't be the only ones who've, who've shied away from that cost. It's easier to, to partner with, with someone local and then build from there. But anyway, moving on to, on to players. Um, player transfers are always a big thing. We never really know what, what a player even costs in South Africa because, you know, those are closely guarded secrets. Why is it that there's secrecy around players? And then how do you value a player as, as the team within, with, you know, behind the scenes? How do you, is there a business model or is it a I, low, 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 so, so 25 million, 30 million? How do you, how do you value the player? <laughs> No, no, no. Firstly, we go with the age. We look at the age of the player. How long has he, uh, has he got to offer in the game? And then secondly, we look at how much are we paying him? How long is his contract? Then we calculate all those things. Then it gives us an amount. Then that amount is your cost. And then you add profit on top of that. Benchmarking okay. with the similar players in the country. You can't benchmark him with Europe or any other country. You have to benchmark right. him with the same player in the country and see that, okay, the certain player, same position, was sold for this amount. Then that's where we right. should be around. But you need to work on age, how much you're paying him, how long is his contract. Those are the things that you you need to look at. Yeah. That's a solid, I mean, I, mean I, I never knew. I've never been in the boardroom of a, of a team, so I don't know. I would assume that that's what you look at, but yeah, it's good to hear that there's there's a there's a model and it's not just you know thumb sucking.